I'm not going to be alone. I'm pressing the CNJ, and I was supposed to be <laughs> leading this session, if I'd arrived. A um, hundred years ago, unions were creating their own media in a radical way that's been unparalleled since. Um, the, the period known as the Great Unrest from 1910 to 1914 was probably one of the most vibrant periods, sustained periods of trade union activity, starting off in the Welsh mines um, in, up to pretty much the beginning of the end in Dublin in 1913 with the lockout. And next year we're going to see the anniversary of London's major part of that, which was the dockers went out on strike, and also Rudolf Rocker was central to bringing the Jewish um, tailors trade union out. Up to 10,000 workers came out in the um, in what were at the time the sweatshops of the East End. Um, after that, there were pretty much no sweatshops left. It was one of the, one of the most fantastic victories of a, of a trade union movement. But central to that movement was media. Um, Rocker pretty much started it off and um, this is something that really that actually trade unions need to take note of. He, t he took it off, started it off by learning to, he was German, learning to speak and write in Yiddish and coming down to London and taking over the Yiddish newspaper and radicalizing it and starting using that as a recruitment tool and an organizing tool. That was the Arbet of Friends, um, which at its height had all, you know, thousands of readers. Um, it had a print run of over 10,000 and a print run um, in what were fairly large families, I mean that thousands and thousands and thousands of people were reading that, and being radicalized up to 1912, where, as I said, 10,000 people came out on strike. Um, at the heart of the general syndicalist movement, there was the original syndicalist and then the industrial syndicalist, which were printed originally by Tom Mann, and then you had the emergence of the Industrial Syndicalist Education League, which was a group that organized meetings across the UK to try and inspire people, and again, at their core, they produced a newspaper that was distributed very incredibly wild, widely. And one of the most interesting examples that came out of this is a paper called The Daily Record. And probably some people remember The Daily Record. The Daily Record started out as a uh, print worker strike sheet uh, 100 years ago. Uh, it's kind of still around, in fact, because unfortunately it was reborn as the sun. Um, <laughs> but I think the, uh, uh, just before we open it up, I think that gives an interesting example of how things can turn one way, but in the current climate, potentially, we could see a reversal of that and see things turned around again. And I think this was what well, the NUJ's position on the news of the world was it was a wrong decision to close it, because effectively that's taken away the opportunity for people to reclaim it. We would much have preferred if people writing and working on the news of the world had been able to take it over and do effectively the reverse of what happened to the daily record. Into the, into the sun. And um, I met with a group of people working for News International within a couple of days of the announcement of the news of the world. And um, things are happening, and think people are talking, and there are still factions within that company who remember the 80s, who were there in the 80s, who fought in the 80s, and lost. But more increasingly, there are people ready for a fight again. So um, this is the big, the big thing in the moment, and this is, I think, the thing that it's great that people are doing, th doing things, but act like, like what Tim and what Real News are doing, what Sheila's doing. But actually, what we need to do is try and get more and more trade unions to recognize the importance of this, to back it, to see it as actually the main avenue for recruitment and organizing and radicalizing. And you know, my hope is that they actually use a lot of the money they waste on the Labour Party to, <laughs> to do that instead. Um, because it's been done in the past, it was shown to be successful, and unfortunately, most trade union information at the moment is focused exclusively at their own membership, the people who already exist. It's an internal, an internal conversation that actually generally fails to enthuse their members as well. Um, that's what needs to change. Trade unions need to recognize that it's only, they're the only ones that can actually communicate to people about, honestly about trade unions, nobody else at the moment, apart from comparatively small, low-budget operations. I think it's unfortunate that you know, there aren't millions out there available to fund Real News or, or Union News or Solidarity, but that's the, the capitalist reality we live in. But there are organizations with lots of money that could be investing, and they are the trade unions themselves. And we agree. So with that, um, I'd like to open it up. I have two quick questions. First is, um, how can people involved in radical media projects 
practically get help from trade unions in terms of support, funding, and leadership. And the second question is for people involved in radical media projects, how do you avoid replicating hierarchies of, that you see in corporate media uh, in your own radical media projects? And how do you make it, um, in terms of just uh, as a work environment, something which is uh, progressively radical? Uh, yeah, area. Anyway. Um, I'll say something on the first one. Um, in terms of getting funding and support from trade unions, um, let's take this two ways. I mean, a um, few years ago, going back to the postal workers again, a few years ago, I was getting a bit of money off uh, the trade union leadership of the CWU for doing podcasts. Uh, they were pretty dull. You know, it was sort of Billy Hayes does a speech. We convert it into a, like a thing to put on, on their website, and so people can see it. But you know, it was getting we were getting a bit of cash out of that, so that was helping fund us make the films. Then the postal work strike started. While it was official, everyone was still happy, etc., with the films we were making. But then it went unofficial, and then they, the leadership weren't quite so happy about the films we were making. And then it got to the point where we put out a film that was saying reject the deal. And then they weren't happy at all. We never got any more work out. <laughs> um, against that, um, every time we film a strike, the trade union branch of concern tends to sort of subscribe. And like the, the way we build, we don't actually want money from the trade union membership because I think it puts you in a compromised position. Um, what we do do is like we have a subscription model for like raising money. Which is, you know, it's a lot slower, obviously, but it's gradually working. Whereby, you know, we encourage people. If you think we're doing a useful job, then we need to get our movement to fund us. So we rely on individuals and rank and file trade union branches to fund us. And what we do find is, you know, increasingly a lot of access, especially in places like United Unions, and they're going, well, we want to support you. And actually, union, unions and United you know, have got shitloads of money. So our branch, what we have got. Even though we might not be able to get a strike off the ground at the moment, we have got money, so we will we will subscribe. You know, it's 50 quid a year, but often we find that union branches will give an extra donation if, if they've got the money in the coffers. Now, that's a very sort of grassroots way of building it up, and it has meant that we've been unbelievably poor for the first few years trying to get it off the ground. But what it does mean is we're in a situation to allow people to say exactly what they want through real news so we can openly advocate people breaking the anti-trade union laws or any other bad laws for that reason. So I mean that's the way we've done it. In terms of hierarchies, it's it's interesting. I think the way that real news works is that people go out and make their own films and then we just sort of whack them out. So the sort of the hierarchy breaks down because of the way we're actually working, I think. I think film is by nature a very collective process. Um, and I think if you're sort of aware of you know the, the pitfalls, etc., and you want to work in a collective way, you can avoid those hierarchies a bit. Well, I understood the second half of the question rightly. I think you were saying, <coughs> how can we avoid just reflecting what's in the mainstream press? Well, the answer makes itself because the mainstream press mostly doesn't report on it. It's things that uh, a trade union magazine like mine or like um, Tim's talking about or indeed Real News, it's, it's, a complete, it's completely hidden from the media. You know, the media's only way of reporting on trade union struggles is to talk about, they use this ridiculous phrase from the 70s, union barons, as soon as anybody actually utters the word strike. But other than that, there's absolutely no coverage of uh, sort of ordinary, ongoing, um, like the file action, like say the Southampton strikes and uh, whatever else is going on. In fact, you know, it's very, very difficult to know what is going on. And, uh, I think um, social worker plays a useful role there with their strike pages. Um, uh, but really, it, also there's um, oh, the guys there. Eric Lee does a, a, a Labour Start, which reports on strikes. But um, really, you know, you won't be treading on any, uh, you know. <laughs> already trodden ground if you want to be writing about what people are actually doing at a very, very grassroots level to defend their pay and conditions of employment. It's unreported world. Um, I'll just very quickly, on, that, on the point as well in, in the workplace, um, one of the reasons hierarchies develop in the media is people prioritise one role over another, rather than recognising that all the roles have a function and aren't necessarily, the editor isn't, isn't the boss. 
the editor has a role and should be there should be more democratic discussions and maintaining that kind of discussion in in a newsroom or in a, a publishing area can actually stop that that you don't prioritise the editor and, and see them as a boss you see them as part of part of the um, part of the system. Um, in terms of what helps available, um, well, there, I probably would say this, but as president of the NUJ, actually, I would recommend that anyone involved in writing a media looks into how they can get involved in the NUJ because there is cheap training available on a wide range of things. And also, uh, get involved in the union, come along to a branch. As I pointed out, if branches have money, branches of the NUJ have money. So come along and if you're a member, you get to vote to give it as well. I was just asking for it. <laughs> Um, and you know, even if you're not making money out of it, we have a temporary membership system, which is a lot cheaper, and you still get um, a role in the union. So, bye. Um, very interesting to hear the range of projects, and in particular to hear Dominic talk about it a hundred years ago. <coughs> As you can probably tell from my accent, I came over from Dublin, and one of the stories in Dublin about the lockout and about the build-up was James Connolly putting a printing press into the basement of Liberty Hall. And we, we had a citizen's army which had armed guard on that printing press because it was hugely important to both the labour movement and the independence movement in Ireland. And that printing press that printed the weekly worker that operated all the way through 1913 and the Lido also printed their proclamation. So in some ways it was this sort of very ambitious scheme where they went out and they invested in this infrastructure to broadcast media. Um, but it was under the control at that stage of the transport union. And it was the transport union's printing press in a lot of ways. At the moment in, in Ireland, the descendants union, SIP2, has invested in a newspaper that has a 50,000 run, brought in journalists, sort of radical journalists, Frank Connolly and Scott Miller, to print this. With a view that, you know, th th there is no union paper, there's no union news. But it is very top down. Would you see that there's a danger with projects like that being a top-down, bureaucratic-driven, and that's where the resources are going to go? Or can you see that there's potential within something like that to go, they're printing 50,000 copies, they're putting it out through a network of quarter of a million members, so therefore engaging with that? And then I suppose the other bit of that question is, is there a potential in television or radio to, to build that as that starts to now splinter and there's opportunities, there's spaces there to create something? Tim might be an interesting person to come in at this point because you've been. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, all, all, the, all the projects we've heard described so far are being activists, um, and I think we should talk also about unions own internal communications, their own media, and what members can do about that. Because, as, as uh, Sheila says, the, the union's publications, uh, magazines, or websites are a crucial part of. Um, Union democracy that members can use and they don't use them enough. I actually, I've edited myself about half a dozen union papers, including 20 years editor of the NUJ uh, magazine. Incidentally, among the ones I edited was the Post Office Engineers Union, which was part of the uh, again, in now CWU. And if you want a story of this sort of thing, uh, my favourite recollection of their media was, I think it was in 1994, they negotiated a big redundancy deal with British uh, Telecom. Uh, and which was entirely agreed by the union, um, something like 200,000 jobs went, and they produced a publication called Opportunity 94, which was uh, designed and succeeded in persuading people to apply for redundancy and take redundancy, uh, and how they should invest their redundancy money, and how they should get retrained for this, that, and the other, and the other things that opposite of what people in this room probably think union journals should do. Um, I mean, I guess most people here are in unions, and I guess most of them, uh, most of you will know uh, how true it is that uh, while commercial publications, as you also probably know, like to claim three times as many readers as they have sales, the trade union journals have to concede a third of their, of their, of their print run as people are actually reading. And, and when I worked for the, uh, for the NUJ, you know, I was always coming across people who uh, uh, contact the end about something, I said, well, there was an article in the journalist about this, and I said, oh, that, I just chuck it in the bin. Now, that's a terrible waste, because if you, if you think about it, most unions produce something now for every member, and if you add that up, that's six million. I mean, that's twice the, boom, twice the circulation of the sun. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic resource that unions and their members could be using for mobilising and raising consciousness among their membership. But the fact is that although 
uh, union publications are actually quite expensive. They spend a lot of money on them, and they're quite expensively produced, and they all have quite fancy design these days. They really make them look very nice. They're horribly patronizing mm -hmm. uh, and, and dominated not just by, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the general secretary should write column, but um, the whole approach of it is top down from the bureaucracy down to the membership. I mean, there, a lot of them really irritates me. This. A lot of them start with, on the inside front page, they have a little letter from the editor, <laughs> like women's magazines, with a, little, with a little picture of the editor saying, what a jolly good magazine we've got for you this month. I mean, how nauseating. I mean, what do they think of people? Are they treat them the same way as IPC magazines treat the readers of women's magazines? But, it's, but the, the answer is surely in the membership's hands. And it's for the membership to use the medium that's there and make an issue out of it in the unit. Now, the NUJ is different. We've recognised that. We were all journalists. And the NUJ has an elected editor, which is elected by the membership. That is by the, by the readers of the publication. And I don't know any other publication that elects its editor but by its readers. But of course, that's obviously a special case. But the fact is, you can make an issue of it in the union. You can put down most of the conferences. You can raise things in your branches. You can write to it. You can bombard it with letters. And yet you read the, the you know, the, in, in, in the journals, the letters page, which are four pages of letters, I thought the most important thing in the magazine, because everybody, uh, everybody used to read it, and people used to write letters. And journalists don't write letters, by the way. Journalists used to write letters, they're cranks. But they used to write letters to the journalists. And you know, I look at other union journals, I do look at them, and there are hardly any letters at all. Now, why if people here are members of a union uh, and have got a, 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 a beef to raise or something, why, why do you write to the union journal and organise people to write to the union? and send them stuff, and if they don't use it, make an issue out of it. I mean, the, the, you can't really expect the bureaucracy to do it, because as Tim was saying at the beginning, the bureaucracy just regards it as, as a propaganda mouthpiece. Indeed, that's what it is. If, if it's to be democratic and to be part of the de internal democracy of the union, then it's up to members to make uh, an issue out of it and raise things with it themselves, it seems to me. Uh, I agree with what Tim's just said. Um, well, not everything, but... Um, I certainly think the NUJ uh, magazine journalism is an exception because, of course, it's well written, written by journalists and it tends to take a pretty radical point of view. But other union journals, I would agree with what he's saying. And they quite often have kind of, I mean, the, the ones that were mentioned were not particularly bad, but, you know, uh, they sometimes have sort of fairly jazzy, radical looking tone to them. But uh, the bureaucracy most certainly does control them. So I think we really need to understand you know, that you're not going to get, however radical the pronouncements of trade union bureaucracies, they are not going to threaten their own position, for example. They are never going to break the anti-union laws as a, as a matter of policy. The anti-union laws, of course, are central. Uh, defeating them or breaking them is central to work class struggle at the moment. So I don't think there's really much controversy about that. I think probably everyone here in the room would agree that leaderships of trade unions, you know, almost through no, can't help themselves but to sort of dominate the membership and discourage unofficial action and that sort of thing. And that's a long discussion we don't have time for here, but you know, I think that we can pretty much take that as read. Um, I think another aspect of the projects that are being discussed here doesn't detract from the usefulness of, say, the NUJ's uh, magazine. But the fact is you need something that goes across the movement. We're all trade unionists. Most trade unionists in large workplaces, which of course are increasingly rare, don't know which trade union they're in. They just, they just talk about the union, the steward is the union. So most ordinary members don't really think much or particularly care about the identity of their own union or their own structure or anything like that. They just want union organization, union protection and so forth. And so certainly the projects that we're talking about today are all uh, cross-movement publications so or videos, uh, etc. And there's another very important point about that, which is that uh, obviously um, the you know the whole dynamic of solidarity is absolutely crucial to uh, any progress within the trade union movement. That's another very grassroots dynamic which people will still see happening in spite of the anti-union laws and so on. And so that's I think what uh, radical media. Uh, within the trade union movement uh, needs to be doing. Um, although, you know, the movement is very weak at the moment, at the same time, if you look at statistics, there's something like, <coughs> excuse me, 150,000 trade workplace reps of various kinds. And uh, if you even take 10% of that 150,000, you've got a substantial number of people who are very committed activists. And I think I've said earlier that workplace activists, workplace reps, 
are really quite exceptional because you know they, they are working alongside their members, so they have that basic democracy and experience, knowledge of you know the labour process, the work process, if you like. But at the same time, they're connected more with the rest of the trade union movement, and they have more of an overview. So workplace reps are an absolutely precious resource, and I think all the media outlets we're talking about here uh, are ones which workplace reps like the building workers that you've been talking about, the site workers, uh, are the ones who are going to take this thing up and use it as a resource um, to help to, you know, strengthen and improve their organisation. <coughs> and I don't think a trade union's own paper can do that. So. At the risk of stating <coughs> the obvious, I mean, as trade unionists, I think you know, the morning star is the only daily paper yeah. that um, uh, gives a point of view from trade unions and um, on the sparks if you know practically every day John Millington is reporting back from what's happening over the country and um, so I think that we need to support the Morning Star and get letters in there if you, you know got problems with trade union leadership or whatever they're really willing to print the, the letters. I'm glad you made that point. I also have a high regard for the Morning Star, and I live in the wilds of Lincolnshire, and order it from my newsagent in Louth, and there are now six copies of Morning Star <laughs> in Louth. <laughs> but I was formerly um, editor of the teacher, the newspaper of the NUT for four years, 80 to 84, and I've always been committed to the trade union movement, to the peace movement. Currently, the last couple of years, I've been very involved in Lincoln and District Trade Union Council. I am the press officer for them. And in fact, to counter the, the extraordinarily interesting, important work, which is fantastic, which we've heard about, I actually do promote <coughs> what we're doing to the local media. My emphasis has always been on the alternative media. That's where my heart and soul is. And we can talk of an alternative public sphere. The public sphere, we should exploit for what we can. I do send them regular press releases. They always use them. They, in, for instance, the Lincoln chap has won an award for the Young Trade Union of the Year Award. He's interviewed by the local radio and television. My students went on, because I teach at Lincoln University, my students went on the big demo in London. They had terrific images of police attacking the, the anarchists who were. Uh, that was used on Granada television. I could go on. There are opportunities if you go for it, because the local media is desperate for copy. That doesn't exclude the central importance of what you are doing. But it's not one-dimensional, the mainstream. And there are openings for us to exploit. I'd like to make a point that actually ties a lot of those together, actually, is that um, one of the most, it is now very easy for individual branches, individual chapels to get their information out. Set up a block. Because if you set up a blog, one, if your union let the newsletter news that isn't using this, if you've sent it to them, put it out anyway. One, it makes it available to everybody else who's doing it. You know, so once it's out there, it's available to people who are looking to cover stories. Um, I'm sure all three people here doing independent news are regularly monitoring for interesting stories out there on the web. Also, unfortunately, the situation with local news is that their number one uh, research tool is Google. You know, the staffing levels of local news are now so low, very few manage to actually leave the office and get out to actually cover stories. But if they're doing a Google search for, the, for their local area and up crops a whole lot of blogs talking about individual worker struggles, the chances of them you know, basically copying and pasting that and sticking it into the newspaper are actually relatively high. Um, and then what will happen is that if you, you'll be in the position to embarrass the local, your union paper that rejected the story and refused to cover it because everyone else is covering it. Um, and ultimately, even the bureaucracy will have to turn around and recognize that they're looking very stupid um, if everybody else, from local newspapers to, to radical outlets, are covering a, a, a dispute and an issue that they're paying no attention to and informing nobody about it. Um, and there have, been, you know, there have been individual examples of, of that. Um, 
and you know, I, as Tim said, the NUJ is fairly special because our members are journalists and they do it. But some of the great examples of some of the material that's been put out have been by individual chapels in dispute and putting out regular blogs. The recent strike in South Yorkshire, um, they got, ended up in a situation where they were doing a free sheet, strike free sheet, that was then plagiarized by the newspaper that they were on strike. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, if, you, if you look it up, it was the, um, yeah, the for South Yorkshire NUJ um, strike because there were some really ridiculous things going on that we were able to publicize. For example, that the editor um, recruited his own son and his son's friend to work in the office to cover, to basically scout for the strikers. And they spent their whole time on Facebook slagging off the paper, which was then picked up and reprinted, and reprinted again, bought via blogs. And then, you know, from the NUJ's point of view, picked up by Sarah, who's edited the website, and went, this is brilliant. And, you know, so once those stories are out there, and people are paying attention to them, and people are looking at them, it can make it available to lots of other people who make it. I mean, I've, I've um, been worked as a photographer for about 30 years. Uh, I'm also a member of the NUJ, but I actually have got experience of working from both sides, if you like. And I started off life as a car worker. I'd be, albeit, I had actually been to art college before that, but when you leave art college, there's not an awful lot of openings in terms of employment. I ended up working in a car factory. I worked in Dagenham for about three years. And we started a newspaper when we were inside the factory. Uh, which is that the company used to produce its own sort of piece of propaganda and we uh, sort of started producing counter-propaganda. They, they had a newspaper called Fraud News and we had a newspaper called Fraud News mm -hmm. which looked exactly like the company newspaper at first glance. Uh, it was a kind of red top and we used to lay, leave it lying around in sort of like uh, locker rooms and things and uh, people at first glance probably picked it up thinking it was a company newspaper so they started reading it. Uh, so, I mean, you know, it was kind of interesting because uh, obviously the union were very keen on this sort of thing, you know, some kind of wildcat stuff going on that they didn't really have any control of, including some of the political parties that had it, that had their sort of uh, little kind of uh, grips inside the factory. They were a bit, uh, they were a bit sort of uh, wary of it as well. But the observation was what happened to union journals, which is quite often they got distributed the convener's office and they sat there in piles and piles and never ever got out to the rank and file membership and nobody ever saw them, you know. Not that they would have been able to sort of kind of relate to them very much, I don't think. I mean, even though at that time I was in the Transport and General Workers Union and there was a paper called The Record, which was actually quite good. But uh, as things went on and like, you know, you got sort of kind of uh, Bill Morris as General Secretary, he would sort of make sure that he got himself on page one. He would end up with photographing himself on page two, on page three, and on page four, etc. And that, I think, was the trend that happened with union journals. I, I'm now retired, so I can say what the bloody hell I want. But Me I did too. actually, for a while, uh, sort of work for trade union journals, so I have to keep my gob shut. But I mean, I just find them a complete waste of resources, quite honestly. I think that, you know, they potentially could actually be something really powerful and really useful. I think what it ends up being is that it just ends up being sort of um, some kind of soporific to sort of, you know, keep everybody sort of thinking that it's all great. I mean, I'm sorry that like solidarity has followed certain tracks that's similar like this kind of thing. Like, happy smiling faces of workers, you know, this is typical trade union journal kind of stuff. I mean, there's a, a Spanish filmmaker called Luis Buñuel who was attacked by a, an, an, another filmmaker called Vittorio de Sica who made a film called The Bicycle Thieves and who thought that like, you know, little kind of urchins living in poverty should be shown in a sort of sympathetic kind of uh, light and uh, he attacked Boomwell for making a film called the, uh, Los Olvidados, The Forgotten Ones, which is about the, the street kids of Mexico, which is quite harrowing. And uh, when I was responding, he said, well, if poverty's so bloody wonderful, what's the point of changing anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to ask an idea maybe for the people who are wanting to get funding from a union to, who are filmmakers, which um, takes on from our experience. We run a festival, Music and Politics in Wales, called Else When You Exist There which is about Victor Harris' alternative. Um, and the 
we went to Unite and we put forward our proposal and they came on board and this year we've been doing, this was the fourth festival, this year they supported us with quite a lot of money and help and from that I learned that um, Unite, which is my union, they are desperate for young members and I guess it's the same with all unions um, and the way that uh, the one way of trying to get new members is to show up, say to the workforce in that workplace, you know, why don't you come to see this film? And then they have a discussion, they try to sign up people. So we were getting them to show War on, is it called War on Democracy? The Pilger film that shows what's happening in neoliberalism in Latin America. Um, and the, my sort of idea from that is if you, your filmmakers, why not put forward a proposal to do something that the union could use as a um, <coughs> to, in that sort of situation? I think you'd find um, funding. Okay. Yeah, just a point on connecting and supporting workplace activists and leaders. Um, employers now have a common HR practice to remove leaders and workplace activists from the workplace. Is there any space on your forums where, where perhaps can discuss the women at this process? My answer to that is really is, of course, very close to my heart. Um, not only do union reps get like, kicked upstairs, a process which has been happening since the mid 70s with the Labour government's <coughs> uh, allegedly positive legislation allowing time off for 20 year duties. So there has been a process of workplace bureaucratisation going on for decades. But more recently, there's been an even more difficult uh, situation for training the reps in that they're absolutely overloaded and bogged down by individual disciplinary cases. I'm um, actually doing some research about this at the moment, but it's also fairly clear from the reps who speak in the pamphlet. So there's not only, you know, a process of bureaucratization which talking to frauds uh, was starting to happen by the, certainly by the mid-80s, not before, I did some research there, and members complained that their stewards spent all their time in the office. So it's that process, and there's also, as I say, the process of people, reps being absolutely weighed down with um, with individual cases, both of which, you know, we could definitely highlight in solidarity because I think there are issues very much worth uh, promoting. But the more positive side, as I've said, we look on the bright side, that, uh, there are these, there are still a substantial cadre of genuine workplace activists who do work next to their members and who recognise that they need to be taking up collective issues and not individual issues. And I think that's an issue which you know, would, would benefit from discussion and debate in all the forums that we're representing here. You know, I'm more interested in when, when actually okay. leaders and workplace activists are actually targeted and taken out of workplace or yeah. to mute their, their effect on their colleagues. Oh, and this, this is happening throughout the UK, different kind of workplaces. There's no forum for reps to sort of go on and say, well, how do I stop this? How do I, how do I bring my case out to the open and say, yes, this happened to me, this is how we dealt with it. And there's no forums out there to reps to actually discuss between themselves and that's going on in workplaces. Yeah, it's worth saying, in fact, that I, just about a year ago, came out of a pretty horrendous experience with something called the National Shop Stewards Network, mm -hmm. which, which was sort an organisation which should have been do, able to do exactly that, yeah. but which was dominated from the beginning by a particular one Trotsky sect and has now become simply a voice for that particular Trotsky sect. Um, and at no point did the leadership of that allow people like myself and others um, to actually organise uh, networks like that, which we wanted to do from the very beginning, but it was blocked in various ways. Uh, I can only say that I hope that all the you know, solidarity will try and take up this issue. We're hoping to go beyond just a magazine to have uh, you know, conferences and forums which can discuss strategy about exactly those kinds of threats. So to yourself, Tim, would you see that yeah. as a sort of like a slot on your website? Um, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're hoping to discuss this sort of at the forum side of it. Um, at the moment, we haven't done that. We haven't got any comments on the website mm -hmm. because we're only too aware that trade unions, the fractalism that, that she has been talking about can happen. You can start slagging people off and everything like that. Um, so that issue you're talking about would be a, a good ground for feature, maybe. You know, some stories and then speak to people about it and report them on what's happening. So maybe in that feature, sort of give advice. But there wouldn't be a, it's not like a, we didn't want to have a proper forum uh, necessarily. <coughs> it's an opportunity, we could do it like that. Um, I mean, it's interesting to come back on some of the other points. Um, I mean, we are, first and foremost, a news website, and that's, that's what we do. And 
And Sean was making the point about the United and the Sparks. Now, we, I mean, we, we shared some footage, I think, with, with the Sparks. Like, we've got two films up with the Sparks. Like, we uh, drove down from Glasgow to capture the people in Lindsay walking out at 6 in the morning. And there's uh, it's quite a powerful film talking to people there. Um, and the relationship with the unions, I mean, that's a unite, they're all unite members. Um, and we, well, we're editorially independent, and you know, we make that very clear. Um, because we know that we can't go down any line, we can't take any particular line. I was just reporting the news, this is what's happening. Um, and we are funded by advertising, and we get advertising from, from the trade unions and from activists as well, and uh, branches. And things. Um, but we make it clear that we're editorially independent. We've already had an issue with United because they weren't too happy about the film. Because, you know, because there's, there's, a, there's a clip of somebody saying, well, we're leading this, and United is struggling to fund this. So they weren't happy about it, and they would then send that link to their film to all their members. But it's not going to stop us reporting it because we're not in, you know, we're not there. We don't do what United does to be what the news is, for example. Um, and the other thing that I found quite interesting is, is the press offices. The point that Tim made is that the different communication departments and different unions have a huge variety of uh, ability. But the way they work um, is, is very, very different. I mean, there's one union that sends out a press release. Then ten minutes later, it retracts it. The word is that I'm not going to tell you which union it is, but apparently, it's because, apparently, it's because the general secretary um, isn't happy with, with, um, with stuff. So, but that's one. Um, I mean, another one that Unison um, don't want to have a big. Uh, they had a strike in Belfast, and so the, the, the uh, hospital workers went out in Belfast, um, and we found out found about it on Twitter. Uh, nothing on their website at all. Nothing on their website. So you know, we put the story up, and then about an hour later, Unison sort of followed and put something up on their website. So it's, that's the trouble we're getting is to try and get uh, getting hold of stories. But we're also we're also making the news as well. We, we had a, a very good story. We had a, a friend, uh, Matthew George, who's a lobby correspondent in Parliament for Pierre. He's, he's writing for us as well. So he's reporting from all the party conferences. Um, and his story that, that's gone, that's, that's been very popular. The headline is, "I am making this up." And that was about when Francis Moore was talking about facility time. And he just said, oh, it's outrageous, it's costing millions and millions of pounds in the And then he admitted that, in fact, he didn't know where those figures came from. Um, and it ignored an official government report that said, actually, facility time is a good thing because it saves employers money by talking, you know, by sort of mediating disputes and things. And it's actually a good thing. But it ignored all that and just came up with some figures that the Taxpayers Alliance and things. Um, again, that's a story you wouldn't have read anywhere else, but we've, we've done that. Um, we also managed to scoop the BBC about uh, the legal stories as well as um, parliamentary stories and things like that. Um, we scoop the BBC about 24 hours about the charges for the employment trial that they, you know, they're, they're bringing in. Uh, that was the lead that we, we put up there and, and then later the BBC uh, do it. So we basically are, you know, we're, we're, um, we're basically a news website. It's the main, the main side of it. Films. Um, we've got a Twitter account, which is at Union News UK. If you want to follow us on that, that's a good way to get hold of us. Because every story that goes up on the website gets tweeted out um, to people straight away. Um, we've got some DVDs, the sort of promo ones that we did, that we launched at TUC Congress, we covered Congress, and that was that was um, quite interesting. I mean, what was what was good about it, I think, was that we, we did speak to the, the rank and file people as they came out of the, out of the, the interview. We filmed them as they came out, so you had uh, a about speech. And we were straight down to the floor afterwards to ask people, what do you think of it? You know, again, there's a like, two minute film, people coming out, you know, saying rubbish or food or whatever it was, getting a bit of that instant reaction. It's things like that you wouldn't, you wouldn't get um, anywhere else. So, um, you know, I hope, I hope that you'll sort of log on and think of some stories as well and, and do contribute. You can contribute to it, you know, we haven't got a forum, you can say. But any ideas for stories? I mean, like that, that's what we should be doing. You know, we should be reporting on sort of situations like that and maybe taking legal sort of advice and things. And, Give advice to people. Okay, <laughs> I'm coming from Greece actually, journalist, not unionized, and I thought it would be useful to give you an idea of what is going on there because it's a very specific situation. Uh, in Greece, all journalists are unionized, and this happens because they have a big, great pie uh, of their, um, how is it? Um, the social um, uh, insurance. It, yes, the insurance project, and this is why everyone is a member. But in order to be able to get this pie among the members, they leave out the freelancers. 
No, the new trend in the media is uh, that you cannot be uh, actually. Uh, they cannot. They will not hire you. They will have you with a contract, uh, not even a contract. You don't sign anything, and you're a freelancer. Mm -hmm. Many many young kids are like this, and they are deprived of every right, yeah. and they are also deprived <coughs> of the, by the right to become a member of the union. Uh, this was the situation until, I believe, until now, because finally we have a left uh, presidency in the Union. And I think they will, they will uh, make important decisions and uh, change things. Now, in general, the situation is that uh, all uh, the big uh, media in Greece are uh, in a state of firing people. Uh, one of our biggest newspapers, Ethnos, Pegasus, uh, uh, has fired from last summer 300 uh, journalists and uh, from other uh, working uh, uh, and, and the union so far did nothing. Now we hope that uh, this will change. Also the newspaper I work for, Elephrodipia, uh, has great uh, financial problems and uh, is, uh, they have announced us, to us very formally that we will have to cut the expenses in half, which means that if you are 800 people, we, we would not say that you will have to stay 400 people, but the, the expenses on wages have to be half, uh, I'm sorry for my English, I hope you understand. Uh, anyway, the thing is that inside the paper, it is very difficult to, and outside, in the other papers too, but in our paper there is some, um, it's a bit different because uh, the journalists really do have, uh, they have earned the right to write however they want. It's, it's supposed to be an anti-imperialist uh, paper. Uh, but the way uh, the management works is very, very different. Uh, we have tried, um, me and some other people, unionized and non-unionized, uh, to activate our co-workers. Uh, the answer we are getting all the time is that we can do nothing, uh, the paper will close, and nothing goes through our hands. We can do nothing. Uh, for the first time uh, the previous week, uh, five, about five workers from us went in the national strike that went on in the public sector with a, a banner uh, of Eletherodipia, and the people who watched uh, the banner was saying, Elisarodipia, uh, we haven't been paid since uh, 15th of July. <coughs> and the people was like, oh, but they are the anti-EU and anti-IMF <laughs> and anti-everything. <laughs> uh, so we managed to make the problem known, because so far it was not very known to the, to the people in general. Uh, we have opened a blog uh, from uh, the the person in charge for the workers inside the paper, which could solve the problem that the boy mentioned there. From uh, the blog, you can have a discussion, uh, answers, questions, uh, this can happen. And Facebook as well can play such a role very, very actively. And we're in a process of uh, trying to activate the people and uh, activate our union as well. Uh, in this process, we would really like uh, NUG and uh, IFG and, uh, to help us in any way possible. Um, we, can have, uh, we can have a conversation about that once, once we come <coughs> out. Actually, we're, <coughs> we're out of time. After that, we could say, well, I hope we, we should say, I hope all the projects we talk about are going to be internationalists. Yes. Have a worldwide struggle as well. Yeah. Right? Um, so unfortunately, we're out of time. Yes. Can we just ask? We've got some workshop evaluation sheets here. So people might oh, like yes. um, um, But people just to finish up. This is a this is a, a big conversation about reclaiming the media and building alternatives. It's one that the NUJ is is going to continue. Um, the next event is actually the Annika Book Fair. I'm going to have got a session on about reclaiming the media and actually similar kind of idea about building alternatives. Um, so anyone who's at the Annika Book Fair will be in the main. Um, Paul, uh, I think it's called the clock, so the first one in the main, the main room. Um, if you want more information, have a look at this session on the live.rebelliousmedia website. 
uh, because I'll put a link to a mailing list we're running as well about building alternative media, uh, alternative media forms um, on that. So if you're interested in getting involved in a virtual conversation about it, keep an eye on that and I'll put a link on that later.